I had a running gag in a video I did a couple of weeks ago about Sebastian Vettel and where it all went wrong for him at Ferrari. Every so often I like to take a driver or a team and find out if they were underrated, overrated, or, or just rated, really. And that gag was, okay, but next year will be our year, because that's the common war cry of Ferrari fans and has been for the last 15 years. After Massa lost the title in those circumstances, 2009 was supposed to be the big comeback. Alonso just missed out in 2010, so 2011 would be the comeback. Then the oh so near of 2012, so it'd be 2013 that's the big comeback. Then 14, then 15, then 16. You get the picture. We're now entering 2024, and by the time this video goes up, you should all be in 2024, unless you live on Mars, where you won't see the new year until November the 18th. And Ferrari fans still hold on to the belief that after all the wait, next year will be their year. And yes, I calculated when the new year will be on Mars, because space is cool. In the 1990s though, they still had this belief. The fans were expectant, the press were expectant, and the drivers were optimistic that the new car could challenge for wins and maybe take a championship if things fall the right way. But in this case, things didn't fall the right way, everything seemed to be going against them, and in turn, Ferrari might have actually developed the worst car they've ever had in Formula 1. That car being the 92A. Ferrari was in a state of change in this time frame. Alain Prost, the then three-time world champion, was on a sabbatical year. He had to take a year away from the sport because he'd been told not to go back to Maranello after describing his 1991 Ferrari as a truck, or words to that effect. In turn, management had gone through quite the change and everything was just a bit up in the air. If social media had existed around this time, people would be getting themselves very excited because it was quite the dose of nostalgia, and for Ferrari fans, the world would have been very rose-tinted. Luca de Montezemolo, a former team principal, had been appointed the president of Ferrari by Gianni Agnelli, and he was the third president in less than five years. Well, fourth, really, because Enzo had died in 1988 and Vittorio Gidella was installed as the president, but he wasn't there long, because Piero Fasaro had been appointed between 1988 and 1991. On top of Luca becoming president of the company, Steve Nichols, one of the design team behind the MP44, was also at Maranello. They basically had the Nui of the last 10 years, although Nui was up and coming at this point. Like I mentioned, Luca was team principal between 1973 and 1975, during which Ferrari had won the Drivers' Championship with Niki Lauda, and Ferrari then had a similar time with team principals that it was having with presidents. And actually, saying that, Niki Lauda was now at Ferrari in an advisory role, so Ferrari, Niki Lauda, Luca, all together like they were winning back in 1975, rose tinted goggles. Luca was the team principal between 73 and 75, then Daniele Audetto in 1976, Roberto Noetto in 77, and then Marco Piccinini in 78. But at least he lasted for 10 years. Then in 1989, Ferrari appointed Cesare Florio for two years before Piccinini came back in. In 1991, Claudio Lombardi was installed as the team principal, although he was just there keeping John Todd's seat warm. Ferrari's downturn at this time was also due to changes with the engine regulations. After turbochargers were banned at the end of 1988, the teams could now choose a V8, a V10, or a V12. Most of the teams had chosen V10s. Some of the poorer teams that didn't have a lot of money chose V8s, while the really brave went with the V12s. The general consensus was that V8s were cheaper, with a little less power, but had good fuel economy and were lighter. V12s were expensive, heavy and thirsty, but had a lot of power, while V10s were that nice middle ground. Although it has to be said that in 1991, McLaren had won the Constructors' Championship with a Honda V12. While the competitive teams were on 10s or 8s, McLaren in 1991 excluded, obviously, Ferrari insisted on V12s. It was their tradition, their identity, that long embedded belief of we will overcome with sheer engine power, which works at Hockenheim or Monza, but less so at other tracks. Maybe that's why Ferrari used them, have all that power at Monza because a home win is a home win. Last in the championship standings, but doesn't matter, we won at Monza. And while McLaren had won the 1991 championship with their Honda V12, Ferrari didn't win a single race that season, and they were determined to bring things back in 1992. But the thing was, they didn't really have a star driver. They had Jean Alesi, in the other car was Ivan Capelli. Nichols and Jean-Claude Mijot took the 1991 car, lobbed it in the bin and designed something all new for 1992 to try and get back to some sort of form. One of the key things about this new car was a double floor, designed to produce more downforce and, again, hopefully make it more competitive. 
A double flat bottom floor, as far as I can tell, is that the side pods and the rest of the bodywork for that matter don't come all the way down. Imagine then, as I can't really find a detailed image that I can use, I've got this model in R-Factor, that'll do. Imagine the entire car sitting on top of the floor as if it was floating. It was the Domino's double decadence pizza of racing cars. One car on top of another car but not in the same twin chassis setup that Lotus tried once upon a time. So again, as far as I can tell, it meant that the air shot through the gap in between the two floors and was way less restricted, therefore producing more downforce. But given that in these days Formula 1 cars ran insanely close to the ground in the post-ground effect era, it looked so odd that there was this car running around that looked like that the ride height had been jacked right up. And those side pods themselves looked like they'd been chaved off an F4 Phantom or something. Ferrari was getting radical with this new design. But immediately, there were problems. While the front suspension on the car was all new and designed from the ground up, the rear suspension was a four-year-old design or something, and they had a lot of trouble working with the new one. On top of this, testing of the new car didn't happen until two weeks before the first race of 1992, which would be at Kyle Army in South Africa. Which sounds normal today because they do like three days of testing at Bahrain and then like the next week they're into the Formula 1 season proper, but back then it was unlimited testing. Ferrari had the ability to lob the car around the Fiorano test track for as long as they wanted for very little cost and then take it for some straight line testing at Magella later on. And all the other teams were doing something similar. A lot of the teams based in Britain especially used Silverstone or they went to the south of France or they went to Spain or they went to Portugal or something like that. But yeah, they, they didn't really test the new car until the last minute, really. I mean, the 1996 car was late as well, which explains a lot. When they finally got to Kyalami, the cars were 5th and ninth on the grid. Respectable, but it's made much worse when Ivan Capelli was 1.1 seconds off a lazy and 3 seconds off Mansell on pole position. Sure, Mansell had a god-tier active Williams, but even then, Senna was 3 quarters off, Berger was just over a second off, and Alesi himself was 1.7 off, which okay is quite common for this time period. While Mansell had his Williams to be 1.5 seconds off your teammate in the same car, that's an oof out of 10 right there. Neither car made it to the end of the race. Their V12s overheated and that was that. The engines had overheated because the oil systems couldn't handle the G-loads and the engine in general was down on power. In the speed traps at the following race in Mexico, a lazy was nearly 9 miles an hour slower in a straight line than the fastest cars, which is about what 14 kilometers, and then the canal boats of the Scuderia BMS team were faster than them in a straight line. And that wasn't just in practice either because the Dallaras were 7th and 9th in qualifying, the Ferraris were 10th and 20th, with Capelli taking Ferrari's worst qualifying position since 1981. Capelli was 3.8 seconds off Mansell on pole. And okay, right, I don't know why I'm saying that he's that far off Mansell because the two Williams cars were nearly a second faster than Schumacher. Really, we should take the grid from Brundle in fourth because that's where the gaps look a bit more competitive. On this particular race weekend, Schumacher, Petrosi and Mansell were all in their own little pockets come qualifying. Capelli was wiped out in a collision with Venlinger's March on lap one while Alesi once again had engine issues. But when the car wanted to work, the cars were able to get a chance of snagging a few points and even a podium. At Brazil, they were 4th and 5th, with the Lazy getting a podium in Spain. Capelli would spin out of the Spanish and San Marino Grand Prix. Okay, in Spain he spun off in the wet, but at Imola, it was a lazy spin into the gravel at Aqua Minerale. The initial blame, at least in public, the initial blame was due to this radical new floor design. They were basically telling people, oh yeah, it's flexing too much and it's upsetting the balance of the car, but really the problem was with the engine. The thing is, Ferrari had a strict propaganda policy. You don't mention any problems with the engine. The engine's got a lot of power. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, well, figure something else out, but you do not mention the engine and its problems. So what they did instead is they blamed it on other issues. The floor, as we've already mentioned, the monoshock suspension, which was brand new for the car, or you blame it on a skill issue with one of your drivers. In this case, Capelli. Capelli spun again in Monaco. In Canada, the power deficit was evident, and then he shunted into a wall at turn four in the Canadian Grand Prix, the same corner where Vettel squeezed Lewis in 2019 or whenever it was. And Capelli said that everything was fine until that moment. The car just didn't want to turn when he put the power down. So maybe the engine deficit had something to do with the diff not working properly or something else. But either way, he put the power down and turned the wheel, expecting to go on his merry way to turn five. But he just went into the wall instead. And because Capelli was having these issues, an Italian motorsport magazine started printing stuff about him. The Italian press is Ferrari or bust, and it can not just be biased, but ruthless in what they print. 
The same Italian motorsport press that demanded Schumacher be put before a Spanish court for what he did in 1997, because in doing so, he'd lost Ferrari its first championship in... Well, forever. But Luca insisted that Capelli would see out the end of the season, and he was confident that the Italian could score more points. Carr was still having so many issues, but it was becoming clear that Ferrari's claims about the floor were not all that. During the French Grand Prix, it started to rain, and Alesi was the last to pit for wet tyres. The car was actually producing a lot more downforce in the wet versus the other cars, and Alesi was able to drive on dry tyres a lot longer than everybody else. Capelli, meanwhile, retired with engine issues, and then at Silverstone, he was 14th on the grid, in a qualifying session where Mansell was so fast, only the top 12 would have qualified under the 107% rule. Hockenheim would be where the world could see that the Ferrari engine was gutless as anything. They were slow, and Capelli was 12th, and nearly two seconds behind Alesi. On top of this, he'd been at March for so long, he'd been so used to communicating with British engineers, and how they did things over here. Coming to Ferrari, a dream for any Italian driver, things weren't going so well, even though they all spoke the same language. Nicky Lauda, who had been brought in as an advisor, was able to help mediate, but it wasn't working out, and Lazy was absolute number one and getting the upgrades. Upgrades to the point where Capelli had basically nothing added to his car other than attempts to keep the engine working. Alesi had been given some chassis and floor upgrades, and these upgrades had also been applied to the spare car, which was exclusively for him. Ferrari had also been making the car slower with these upgrades because their attempts at understanding what was wrong was having an adverse effect, or they were trying to distract from the fact they'd built a crap engine. They created a new version of the floor to verify that the car didn't have an aero imbalance. After that, they tried to install a transverse gearbox that made the car wider, so it knackered the airflow in two of the channels. All of this was eating into the upgrades for the season. So what I think was happening was they were applying upgrades to the car, realising they weren't working, and then just reverting back to what they had before, because what they had before was better, and that was just, you know, eating into the budget. But after the Hungarian Grand Prix, it was finally time to admit that the engine was rubbish. I mentioned the BMS team earlier, the Dallara outfit that had outqualified the two Ferraris in Mexico. They were a Ferrari customer team and were running the 1991 engines, while the factory team got the newer and, well, not in this case, better ones. So between the Hungarian and Belgian Grand Prix, Ferrari went to Monza with a Lazy and one of these older V12s to see what was wrong. A Lazy was up by at least 40 horsepower, and all of this was greatly annoying the design team because they were being used as the scapegoat for something that wasn't their problem. They were being led to believe that their radical new floor was the issue, but really, it was the power plant department. Ferrari has always lived in the myth of its engines, Mijo told Motorsport.com, but there was no such criticism of the V12s because that would have been like cursing in church. Although it seemed obvious to everyone that the engine was the big problem with the F92A, the blame was put on the aerodynamics. So what I'm guessing happened here is the engine department told the chassis department, it's not our problem, it's you, it's this new floor that you've got. So the aero and chassis department start looking for a problem that doesn't exist, try to fix a problem that doesn't exist, <sighs> or because you can't slag off a Ferrari engine. They later found the issue. The engine was suffering from something called blow-by. This is when oil leaks from the piston rings in the combustion chamber, which a lazy claim lost them between 40 and 50 horsepower. But as established, you can't slag off the engine, so something else had to be blamed. The engine had to use an extra oil tank to make sure there was enough to get them to the end of the race. The monoshock suspension the car had was then harder to set up because they were working around this tank. The TLDR is, this oil tank spaffed so much oil that the engine basically ran out of lube too quickly and it either overheated or ate itself alive. So for the Belgian Grand Prix, a new updated version of the car came. The 92AT had new front suspension, a 7-speed gearbox, a new front wing and a more rigid setup for the engine housing. But Capelli retired with engine trouble again and then spun off at Monza then had engine trouble again at Estoril. By this point, Ferrari had made a phone call to Woking and pried Gerhard Berger away from McLaren to come in and replace Capelli for the 1993 season. After the Portuguese Grand Prix, Capelli was dumped for Nicola Larini, who was testing an updated 92 AT that had the 1993 active suspension system on it, which made his car 30 kilograms heavier than a Lazy's that wasn't running it. Capelli scored just three points all season, this being a time where only the top six scored points. His fifth place in Brazil and a sixth place at Hockenheim being his only points finishes, while a tenth in Spain and a ninth at Silverstone being the only other finishes he scored all season. While he experienced five engine failures through 1992, the other retirements were mostly handling related issues. As such, Capelli was 13th in the driver's standings on countback, a lazy seventh with 18 points. 
Due to the inherent issues with the 92A, Capelli wasn't able to show what he'd been able to do at teams like Leighton House. His qualifying times were often way off a lazy, and we won't really go into pole times because of Mansell's car being what it was that year. His performance and the car's performance was so bad that if you were given the question any Ferrari driver in Formula 1 on the game show Pointless, he might be one of the pointless answers. Nobody in the audience would know that he did a season with the team. Ferrari's dry spell did not improve after 1992. The 1993 car was a bit more reliable and scored 7 more points than it had the previous year, but it was still winless, a duck that would finally be broken in 1994. A duck is a cricket term, by the way. On top of this, Jean Todd had finally joined the team following the end of Group C endurance racing, and he and Montezemolo would start putting the plans in place to get Ferrari to the top. And it would start by eyeing up the lads working at a small factory in Oxfordshire. People look at Ferrari's problems now and think that now is the doldrums, that it can't possibly get any worse than this. But between sort of 1991 and 1997, it reads a little bit like one of those really bad Vietnam War films, where they start talking about the problems in 2023 or maybe even 2024, and the people that saw it happen in the 1990s will be like, You weren't there, man. You weren't there. In Italian. So then, a look at the dismal Ferrari F92A and the adventures of Ivan Capelli. If this has taught you something new about the world of motorsport, then do like the video so the algorithm can do its thing, and subscribe because, well, 100k is getting closer and closer and I can get that Moreno video out of the way. Also, a massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help keep the picture purchasing piggy bank topped up, then links are in the description to Patreon, Discord, socials, and affiliate links because I think there's still a sale on at the F1 store right now. There's also memberships and super thanks if that's more your thing. So until next time, I've been Ada Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.